This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello everyone, welcome to Living History and an episode where we're going back a little bit further than what we've been doing lately because we've had a lot of World War II focus with the 75th anniversary of D-Day and other significant anniversaries that have been happening very recently. But I want to go back to World War I and to a chapter of World War I that I think is a little bit unknown in Australia and we should know more about it. This was the opening chapter of Australia's war during the First World War. Joining us to discuss it is historian David Howell. So, David, welcome to Living History. Thanks a lot, man. So, we're talking here, mate, 1914, which was a time when I think people didn't even realise Australia was actively involved in the war. I knew, you know, I think people know that we were at war. We declared war on the Germans, that we were preparing to fight. But I think a lot of people assume that Gallipoli was our first action of that war. Paint a picture for us. What was happening in 1914 uh, in, uh, in very close to our home? Yeah, so most people uh, that you speak to, especially I'm Melbourne-based, I'm um, looking out now into Port Phillip Bay, and they all talk about the first shots being fired at Point Nepean um, as the um, uh, SS Flats tried to make uh, way and get out to sea when it was a merchant ship when um, uh, when the First World War was declared, a German merchant ship, and uh, a shot was fired and they no one was hurt. They stopped the ship from leaving. But... Uh, our first uh, battle, and a first of many firsts actually for Australia, uh, happened immediately to our north in what is now Papua New Guinea. So just paint a picture for me about the, the, the politics, about the geography. I mean, how, how was it possible that we were fighting in New Guinea in the First World War? We think of New Guinea, it's famous actions during the Second World War, but uh, I think many people would be surprised to know there was fighting there that went on in the First World War as well. Yeah, so... Uh, we don't have to go back that far before the before 1914. In fact, we only have to go back a few decades, 1884, when um, Germany, who itself was a, a new a new country, uh, was going around and trying to build up an empire, like it. You know, I wanted to emulate what Britain and France, etc., other European powers had done, and I guess it wanted to go and get territory that didn't have. Um, uh, a cause to have a fight. So they, they bought uh, several Caroline Marshall Islands uh, up in the Pacific. They bought those off the Spanish. They um, set down in, um, in New Guinea, uh, and there is a distinction between Papua and New Guinea. Um, uh, and they wanted to have an area, I guess, where they could control um, uh, their trade, but also have a presence in, in, in the Pacific. So 1884, Germany annexes New Guinea, much to the dismay of the colonies, because obviously Australia isn't federated then, and Queensland in particular, because it had been using um, uh, the Solomon Islands and, and Papua New Guinea uh, to uh, do a not-so-nice thing, blackbirding, to build up the sugarcane industry, of course, in, in Queensland. And they were worried that uh, Germany was going to impose on, on the territory up there. Britain didn't really want anything to do with it. Uh, in fact, the reports from the British East India Company had come back and said that this is a miserable place. Why would anyone want anything to do with it? So long story short, even though Germany had said to Britain, no, no, we're not interested in, in, in New Guinea, in 1884, they hoist the flag, they annex that part. Um, we actually, when I say we, Australia, the colony of Queensland, with the help of Victorians and New South Welshmen, go up there, raise the Union flag in Papua, which is the lower part. And um, and Britain says, well, hang on a second, why why are the colonies uh, doing this? And and long story short, um, we become federated. 1905, they have the Act of Papua, and the bottom part becomes Australia, and everything to the north becomes German. So, David, talk to me about this time. I mean, it was a tumultuous time in Europe, and the Germans weren't exactly considered everyone's best friend at this time. How did Australia feel? about having a German colony right on its doorstep? Didn't like it at all. Um, and, you know, so much so, as I said, that they colonies uh, went up up there to try and, um, you know, put their own uh, presence in the area. Um, New Zealand, obviously our other neighbour, was very, very worried because the Germans got German Samoa. Uh, so there was a lot of um, presence, if you will, of the Germans breathing breathing down our necks. And obviously at that stage, Australia was British 
and we looked towards Britain and Britain and Germany um, was already heading um, to war. And um, we didn't like it at all. Um, in fact, the uh, East um, Asiatic Squadron, which was under the command of a chap, a German fellow named von Spray, he had uh, some very powerful ships, including the Schornhurst, the Nicenau, and of course, most uh, listeners would be familiar with the Emden. Uh, Australia had a, a navy, it was fairly new. We did have one ship, uh, HMAS Australia, that could outgun the German ships, but um, we were very, very worried that, um, um, that the Germans were, were on our doorstep, if you will. So the Germans were there for several decades before the First World War. What were they doing in New Guinea? Why was it important to the German Empire? A couple of things. First, first of all, um, they wanted an empire, so they wanted land. They wanted land to spread, spread out across uh, trade routes for shipping because at that time in history we still relied heavily on, on, on ships to move um, materials, cargo, etc., around the around the globe. Um, but also um, the Germans uh, wanted to really have a presence where they could, um, you know, sum up any of the territorial uh, gains that they'd made. As I said, it was non-violent kind of gains to begin with, but perhaps preparing for something um, um, great, bigger and better. And to sum this network up, Von Spray had his fleet, but the important thing, and this is very important to this battle, is that now messages didn't take you know, weeks or months or weeks rather to get across um, the Earth's surface, they had a wireless uh, uh, radio system, if you will. And now, you know, from Germany to to um, this part of the world, you could get a message within a day, which was an amazing feat if you think of it at the time. So all across these, these territorial gains that Germany had made, they started to build a, a wireless um, network where they could send messages and they could control their navy, if you will, in 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 the, in the backyard of of Australia. It's an interesting point. Whenever we talk about the First World War, David, that, that there's there's often a debate about whether Australia should have been involved. Whether it was a European conflict that we should have kept our noses out of, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think this is a really fascinating point that we can't stress strongly enough. Effectively, Australia's nearest neighbour was a German colony at the time of the outbreak of the First World War. I mean, that must have been that that must have been nerve wracking for the Australian people at that time. Oh, uh, immensely so. And, you know, uh, this has ramifications that last um, now in, in, in present day because a lot of Australia's effort um, in um, since we became a nation is to have this buffer zone to our immediate north. I myself uh, did peacekeeping operations in the Solomon Islands. Why was I there? Our Solomon Islands was unstable. We need to keep this buffer zone. We've got... Um, uh, new threats in the Pacific now, and of course, in the Second World War, we had the Japanese breathing down our necks. But in the in the First World War, uh, at this time, uh, Australia was very important that we, and we should rightly so, have gone and uh, had this uh, buffer, if you will, between um, Australia and 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 the rest of the world to the north. So the First World War started in in New Guinea, and the battle fought there. I would argue is. Um, is one of the most important battles that we've fought as a nation. Well, tell us exactly what happened, David. So the war begins in August 1914. Australia declares war on Germany, following hard on the heels of, of Britain. What does it mean for our location? What does it mean for Australia in terms of our own defence, uh, particularly the fact that we've got a German neighbour uh, very very nearby? Yeah, as we all know, Australia had pledged, our Prime Minister had, had, had pledged to send troops to to fight for for empire, if you will, and um, Britain had asked Australia very quickly, um, pretty much soon, very soon after war declared. So war is declared fourth of August fourteen, and a message comes and says that if you can, Australia, please go and get rid of the German um, uh, wireless stations, uh, take that, capture that territory very quickly. So that's what we do, and in a relatively short time. Uh, we're talking um, just a week, basically. By the 11th of August, we're already starting to recruit uh, men to go and um, off on this expedition. And we actually create a special expeditionary force, and it's called the Australian Naval and Military Expeditionary Force. And there's a first there because not only is it going to be our, um, which I'm getting to, our first battle, but it's the first uh, combined operations, if you will, between the Army and the Navy. 
So tell me more about these men. Did they volunteer for service? Were there was there regular soldiers that were that were uh, formed into this new unit? Um, who were these men that would end up fighting this battle in New Guinea? Well, interesting enough, um, you we because we raised a, a expeditionary force, we called for volunteers, and um, the the guy who was the chief of staff at the time, and I'm sure some listeners may may, may be familiar. With that was a was a chap uh, named Leg, who um, Lieutenant General James Gordon Leg, uh, who um, would later go on and command the Australian Second Division on Turkey and and um, the Western Front. Uh, but he um, he got uh, the the task fell to a Boer War veteran, a chap named um, William Holmes, and um, he was criticised. Actually, uh, he actually writes a letter to Leg and says, "Hey, isn't this wonderful? You know, we've managed to recruit." in the space of a week, uh, a force, uh, a battalion, a battalion size of over a thousand men, about 1,023 men. And um, he goes then before the minister at the time, the minister for war, because we're at war, uh, who basically criticizes him because he allows married men. Can you believe that? He allows married men to be um, to be um, recruited into this expeditionary force from the military side of it. On the other side of it, which actually come into play because these are the guys who are going to do the fighting, uh, a naval uh, component, and uh, many of the naval um, men formed into companies. There were six companies. Um, the Navy had 50 men in each of those companies, which broke down to half companies of 25. A lot of them were reservists. Some of their commanders and that, and were obviously um, regular naval guys, but most of them were reservists who uh, joined up uh, to go and fight in this uh, expeditionary force. And they, as we will see um, as we a conversation develops, they're the guys that actually do the fighting. So these men, when they enlisted, were they were they signing up to fight the war against Germany and then they found themselves fighting closer to home than they anticipated? Or was this a special recruitment just to take care of this German problem on our doorstep? Yeah, funnily enough, the ANMEF was a special force raised just to go and take care of the problem to the north with the Germans and the radio stations. In fact, many men... Um, you see in the, because uh, a lot of the, the uh, military component were from New South Wales, that's where Holmes was from. A lot of the men, if you look at the 20th Battalion AIF, a lot of the guys end up going into that, but they have to, in effect, discharge from the ANMEF and then re-enlist into the AIF. In fact, there are accounts of men uh, who are sick because obviously you've got things like malaria and whatnot, and they have to either change names or, or hide that fact in order to get into the AIF. So this was purely a force, specially raised, for this task. And as I said, it was done very quickly within the space of a week or so. And what about training for these guys? They had enlisted pretty quickly, as you say, they were thrust into this new unit. How well trained were they by the time they were sent up north? Well, a lot of them had done um, uh, military service uh, under the scheme that was running at the time. They may have done uh, school cadets, so they could operate the rifles, they could drill, they could do all that sort of thing. But they were going off to do a very different type of warfare, uh, a warfare that we've never experienced. In fact, it is our only, it's jungle warfare, and our only experience before the Second World War was this battle. But they um, they set sail, they, um, they they leave Sydney on the 19th of August, so again, very close to um, since the outbreak of war, and on their way, they have a bit of a stop on Palm Island, and they do some training there. But it doesn't prepare them, their, their equipment, well, they got their Lee Enfield 303 rifles as their main um, weapon system, but they're wearing Bedford cord breeches and a woolen shirt that tucked into it with a collar. So it's wool, which is not, which is probably great if you're running around uh, Melbourne or, or or Sydney, but maybe not so great when you're about to go off to the to the tropics and fight in the jungle. So what were the German preparations? Because they must have expected that um, that that a force would land against them in New Guinea. How, how did the Germans prepare to defend their uh, territory in New Guinea? Yeah, so interesting enough, in, in German New Guinea, um, you imagine if you were to look at a map of, uh, of the right-hand side of what is now PNG, you have the main uh, part uh, with Port Moresby down the bottom, bottom being the capital, and then if you go north, uh, after you leave Papua, you're into what was then German New Guinea, and then you get an island above it called East New Britain, although the Germans had, had renamed that. They'd also renamed the main uh, part. Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm's Land was the name of the main part of the, of the mainland PNG. And um, they knew, of course, that um, they would be a target. But their preparations were very, very 
different. They didn't have a lot of resources. Um, not much money was spent on defence. They did use native troops. Um, they withdrew uh, back to that island that I spoke about, East New Britain, from the mainland. In fact, only a couple of uh, days before uh, the ANMEF arrived in Rabaul, they the G German governor, a guy, or the acting governor, a guy named Dr. Harbour, he actually moved his seat of government, if you will, to that island and consolidated. They also removed the wireless station and they took it back into the interior um, along with their headquarters staff and all of that. But to give you an idea, there's only really about 150 um, native troops and they're reservists. The German um, guys are reservists or they're, uh, vol they're just volunteers within the ger German community. There was quite a, a big German community in Rabaul prior to the Australians coming, but all the, all the German side were basically volunteers or, or local uh, native forces. And how many Australians were sent up to German New Guinea? You mentioned that there was both army and navy forces. Give us a bit of a breakdown of, of how many men were actually sent up and what type of ships, because there's a couple of special things particularly to note on the navy side, wasn't there? Yeah, so, um, uh, so for example, uh, the military component, as I said before, was a battalion strength that was 1,000 men. Um, so we certainly, and we had machine gun, we had a, a, a small uh, artillery attached to to that within that force uh, so we out we certainly out outnumbered them in 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 strength although we didn't know that of course at the time um from the naval uh, side of things um in terms of the the men to go and do the um the fighting if you will they had six companies as i said each company was 50 men uh, so there's 300 odd men there so our, our sizable force of of being able to do action that doesn't include the, the naval the naval staff on the ships um was really you know, only around you know less than fifteen hundred men, and um, and it's it's interesting to note uh, why the naval component of of the expeditionary force was the ones the first ones to go in to battle because up until that stage you think what the navy uh, uh, within the empire was up to um, they would they had a long history of being able to go down put shore parties down and capture things close to the shore and then garrison them whereas armies were things that went out onto a field of battle and met, met their enemy on a field of battle and fought. So I guess they were very well drilled in being able to put their boats down and to do landings because the landing that, that we're getting to in Rabaul was a first for Australia because it was the first amphibious landing that we'd done. Uh, certainly, you know, it, not, not, it wasn't Gallipoli. It was here in Rabaul. Isn't it fascinating when you talk about this, David, and it's something that regular listeners of the podcast will have heard me say before, but the evolution of technology, strategy, tactics in the First World War was just extraordinary. And I heard someone say once, another historian say that in 1914, a Napoleonic era soldier would have recognised what he was looking at if he could observe the battles of 1914. But by 1918, a modern soldier of today would recognise the tactics and the technology and, and how that war was being fought. And it's a wonderful example the way you're describing this Australian force heading up there. And as you say, the fact that the Navy thought, well, the way to do this is to use our troops because these are the guys that are going to be best equipped to come from ships to land on the shore. And armies are more to be used on large fields of battle to manoeuvre and, and and to hold ground. So it's 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 I'm seeing reflections in that sort of Napoleonic mindset that that armies are for, for big manoeuvres Maneuvers uh, and these small little operations are more for the navy guys to carry out. Oh, exactly. Um, as I said before, armies really were bodies of men that go and um, you know fight on in, in on the field of battle. And um, uh, you know, British Empire uh, had built its empire based on um, shipping and trade and putting down parties and then garrisoning garrison ports. So the Navy actually, when you think about it at the time, they were best suited to be able to do this type of warfare. The Navy was also fairly technologically advanced, wasn't it? Because we had things like AE-1, the Australian submarine, was up there accompanying this this force as well. So the Navy was actually demonstrating it had some some fair advantages in, in terms of the technology of the day. That was a very, very much so in the in the sense that uh, it was quite proud because you think we're we're only you know we're only um, a decade on really from um, the navy being formed. We have our flagship HMAS Australia, but you're right. We have these two um, submarines, the AE one and the AE two, uh, which is you know submarines, wonderful uh, technology. Made the um, 
a correlation there before Napoleonic um, soldiers. Many imagine from the naval side of things, yeah, the technology had grown in leaps and bounds prior to this. It would take the um, uh, three or four years of the fighting in the First World War for the army to sort of um, catch up with their personal weapon systems and planes and tanks and all that sort of stuff. But the Navy uh, at this time, or well, navies around the world at this time, was certainly... Um, you know, Britannia still ruled the waves. We had a lot of technology in there and um, very much proud uh, Australia was to have the Sydney, um, to have um, the AE-1 and the AE-2, which we not long bought from Britain. So, David, tell us what happened. This Australian force heads up to New Britain uh, to uh, to take back the wireless station. Tell us how the, uh, the fighting there unfolded. Yeah, so it's... Um, it happens over the course of, of one day. It's very, very, very um, um, easy date to remember. September 11th, um, uh, that, that they go and land on, on New Britain. Uh, I should say just before that, uh, though, that the um, um, on Nauru, everyone will be familiar with Nauru, HMAS Sydney went and got rid of the, well, put the wireless station out of action, although there wasn't a fight there like what we're about to hear, but we'd already started, the Navy had already started to go up and take care of these things as the Navy, uh, sorry, as the Army, uh, the military component of was coming up behind. But um, just let's go to that moment, if we will. Um, basically, uh, what had happened is that the um, the Navy had, had in tow a P&O liner that had been converted to a troop ship that was bringing um, a lot of the sailors and the Army component up, which was the Berrimer. And... Yeah, on the um, the first thing they do is they go into Rabaul, into the harbour. There's beautiful Simpson Harbour. It's one of the most magnificent harbours in the world, I think. And they put down at 7 a.m. in the morning, they put down um, uh, 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 the naval guys at a place called Cabacool, which is near Blanche Bay within that, that harbour. And um, if, re- if listeners are familiar with the geography of Rabaul, uh, you've got Rabaul to the right and um, Kokopo to the left and, and Blanche Bay is on the um, left-hand side. So they put down um, um, the naval component, which at that time consisted uh, of, you know, 30-odd men. They had with them one Australian soldier who we'll find out about in a moment, but his name was Pockley. He, Brian Pockley, he was uh, um, uh, a young doctor from Sydney, uh, had uh, followed in his father's footsteps I've uh, been a Macquarie Street doctor. He was um, much loved at his at his school, and he really was, um, uh, I guess, the man's man. Of well liked, uh, had volunteered his service and to go with the naval component because they needed somebody to be their doctor. Uh, the whole battle unfolds basically from a jetty uh, going up a hill along a uh, along a road, and when the Australians rock up. They actually find inside a, a house, if you will, that was very close to the shore, some Carl Zeiss binoculars, German binoculars, which, and a couple of revolvers on the table. So obviously the Germans had only just stopped observing the Australians coming and they withdrew back up this road, which leads up to the wireless station. Along the road, they had built small trenches and they were defended by, as I said, German reservists, if you will local people that were doing the military service and um, native troops. And when the Navy component puts down, that's what they do. They start walking up the road. In fact, um, the commander on the ground, his name was Bowen, he um, he took and asked a Chinese uh, fellow who had happened to be there working in one of the houses and some of the, the, the local Tolai people where the Germans were, and they basically said, yeah, look, they're up the road, and off they go. That's how the battle started. So you've got this Australian force advancing up the road. Um, Germans obviously know that they're there now. So so what happened in those uh, those following minutes? Yeah, so uh, the Australians start to move along the road, but the commander says, hey, look, we're going to be exposed on the road, so they get off into the bush. Um a lot of the guys with their woolen uniforms on, they get scratched and cut to pieces by the jungle. They start con- um, converging back onto the road. And it doesn't take long before, as I said, those uh, Germans and the native troops spy them. A shot rings out. Uh, the first shot, actually, that was fired in anger by Australians in the First World War was by a petty officer named Palmer. He spies um, one of the, the, the um, Germans. He ends up shooting him, doesn't kill him. He shoots him in the hand. 
Uh, the Australians keep moving forward. That guy Pockley that I spoke about, the medical officer, he um, they capture the the, sm- the first line of Germans, if you will, for only a small handful of men. Pockley com- uh, performs an amputation without anaesthetic, cuts the German's hand off. It says that the German, whose name was Mordera, he um, uh, bit down on a cigar and, and didn't betray the, uh, the the pain that he was going through. And then they regroup and they continue moving up up this road through the scrub. They actually spy um, some local people working in their gardens. Uh, in fact, the, some of the um, men that were there later write that it was a bit like a, uh, a Sunday school picnic. They, you know, they were off there like a, uh, almost as a venture. It was very, you know, different than the horrors that are going to befall the Australians in Gallipoli and the Western Front. So they keep moving up this road and, um, and then another shot rings out, but this time it's the Germans turn and they hit one of the sailors, uh, a young guy from Northcott here in, in Melbourne, a guy named Billy Williams, and he he becomes Australia's first casualty in in the um, in the First World War. He's shot in the stomach. He's not. He doesn't die straight away. Pockley, the medical guy, comes back down, attends to him, and not only in that moment do we have the first casualty for Australia in the First World War, but we also had the first act of bravery. Pockley takes off his uh, armband, his Red Cross armband as they're carrying up um, Williams away on the stretcher and um, they take him back to the Berrimer. Later on, Williams would die next to Pockley, which we'll get to in a moment um, in the afternoon. So after that, they continue going on. It doesn't take long. More shots ring out and um, uh, unfortunately, Pockley too uh, becomes uh, a casualty, becomes our section second casualty and the first army casualty of the um First World War, and he's taken back. And as I said, sadly, both of them, they're not sure uh, who dies first, but they both pass away, you know, two, three, three o'clock in the afternoon. So this all happens around 9.30 in the morning on the um, 11th of September. Um, Whilst this is all going on, the Germans have done other things. They've actually put a big mine in the road. And one of the things they were going to do is the Germans fall back to their different positions, if you will, along this road, is that they were going to blow the road up and effectively kill uh, whoever was coming to take the um, wireless station. But the, fortunate enough for the Australians, the, um, the, the the native fellow that the Germans had trained to do that was sick. He actually had malaria, they believe, and he didn't turn up for work that day. So <laughs> it doesn't go off. Um, now, also while this is going on, the commander on the ground, uh, Bowen, he decides that he's had enough of this getting bogged down and he actually pulls out his revolver. And remember the chap I mentioned, that the German guy that had his arm amputated, he f- basically frog marches him up to the next line of, um, of the German trenches. Uh, and these aren't trenches like we think in the First World War. These are more of a uh, just a makeshift trench, if you will, across the just to give them some cover. Wouldn't be enough, I guess, for a man to stand up in. And, but Bowen frog marches this wounded German up there and basically says, listen, tell the rest of your mates to surrender or I'm going to um, do some, um, you know, do some not so nice things to you. And, and that's another first for Australia, albeit not a not a great one, but uh, and unbeknownst to Bowen, but he'd actually um, broken the rules of warfare because he used a prisoner, you know, because the, the poor German chap had obviously surrendered that had his uh, um, hand amputated and he uses a prisoner to go and get the others to surrender, but it works. And he thinks, you beauty. So off they go. And they continue to to go um, up along the um, up the road. But you have to realise this is very, very short space. It's a, it's not an overly big hill. In fact, if anybody's been to Rabal and visited Bitter Park or War Cemetery, the road you go up to the cemetery, which you would easily get up in a car and you know, five, ten minutes' time. That's where the battle unfolds. Um, meanwhile, back out at sea, um, the Australian command, if you will, especially those on the on the Berrimer, were thinking, well, hang on a second, you know, it's almost midday now, and um, what's happened? You know, there was only meant to be a few Germans. We're just going to walk up a road to uh, find this radio station and it'll all be over. But the Germans, um, funny enough, with under, under strength by comparison to the Australians, they were putting up... Not a bad fight. In fact, Bowen goes again and takes German prisoners and frog marches them up to the next line, but it doesn't work. And he himself is actually shot and it, and it grazes, it literally parts his hair. Um, it grazes the top of his um, forehead or scar that he lives with for the rest of his life. 
uh, he survives and he's actually taken off the field of battle. Um, meanwhile, uh, some of the Germans uh, that was captured in those trenches included uh, a senior German on the, on the spot, a captain, and uh, he was a bit of a prize and they took them back and they got some more intelligence on, on exactly where the radio station is. They knew it was up the top of the road and they keep going on. But back on the, on the ship, Berrima, you get this really interesting um, thing unfold. There were men going about having their breakfast, smoking their pipes, writing letters, all that sort of thing, letting the naval um, contingent go off. Some other naval forces had land further down uh, in the harbour, but nothing, no action was going on there. And they get this report that the Australians are getting fired upon. I mean, casualties are coming back. You've got two Australians back on the ship. And you get this crazy thing where they need to call for reinforcements. And whilst the other detachment that had landed it starts to make its way along, men on the um, SS Berrima, you get a cook. There's a story of a cook um, grabbing a ladle. There's another guy that doesn't have uh, much uh, in the way of a weapon. He picks up a, 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 a plank of wood, if you will, off the, off the, off the jetty, and you've got a ragtag sort of, they must have looked like pirates, you know, leaving, leaving the Berrima to race up to give aid to, to, to the Australians. You also, unfortunately, because um, obviously there's a, um, there's a sad element to this, we ended up lo- losing six, six people, uh, but you have um, another casualty, and this casualty was killed outright, as they're advancing further along to the um, uh, to the German trenches, you get a a chap a John Edward Walker or John uh, Courtney, uh, whichever uh, way you want to want to um, um, uh, call him. He'd actually changed his name. I thought at first he perhaps changed his name to put his age up, as we all hear those stories. He actually changed his name because he didn't want to pay maintenance <laughs> to his wife. <laughs> which is a, a funny one, but he ends up getting shot and killed outright. Um, and he, um, he um, um, uh, is, you know, uh, our first, he, he, they believe he dies before Pockley and Williams pass away on the ship. And there's no denying that Williams is the first Australian casualty, but um, uh, Courtney is the first Australian casualty to kill, be killed outright. Now, again, all this is unfolding and, you have this situation whereby, you know, something that was not meant to take much time, they're only using 30-odd men, is turning into prisoners coming back, casualties. We've got people killed now. You know, um, there's a, there's another uh, chap, uh, Street and Moffat, that get mortally wounded. Um, one chap dies the next day. Um, you know, you've got all this stuff going on, and, and they're, getting, they're getting bogged down. And so enters two other chaps that I want to talk about in this battle. One is Charles um, Edwell, Charles Bingham Edwell, who was actually seconded from the Royal Navy uh, before the ANMEF was formed. He was actually down at Geelong, just on the other side of the bay from where I am at the moment. He was down there at the, that's where the Naval College was. And he is well above his peers. In fact, by all accounts, he's uh, dressed quite um you know, for the occasion, he's got his sabre with him. And, um, you know, he's a guy who could speak French. He's quite worldly. Um, he's above his peers, I guess, in that way. He says, listen here. And, and by the way, he's the highest ranking man uh, on the scene. He's a lieutenant commander at this. Um, and he comes into the, the fray. He gets up to uh, the, the second last, I think, at his line of German trenches with some of the men. Uh, Bowen had been taken off the field of battle. They'd had another chap that um, that was on on one side. Elbow takes the other side of the road. He gets up near the trenches. He pulls his saber out and he says to the men, "He says, fix bayonets." Now we're about to have Australia's first bayonet charge of the Great War. And he pulls his saber out, tells his men to fix bayonets. He takes a couple of steps and he's shot in the chest and he's dead. And I think he becomes our second outright. Um, KIA in the First World War. Um, so it doesn't go too well. Eventually what happens is that um, there's a break in the battle. Another chap rocks up, Bond. I like that, introduced. I wish he was Lieutenant Commander Bond, but he was Lieutenant Thomas Bond. And he's about to get the first uh, decoration. He ends up getting a DSO uh, for what the, what's about to come about. He, he gets up there, Elwell's being killed, 
the Germans are ready to surrender, but the German, the senior German uh, officer at the up there, he won't surrender to these ragtag bunch of guys that have been cut to pieces in the bush, you know, wearing, um, you know, uh, dishevelled uniforms, if you will, sweating, whatever. And they actually stop and have a break, and they pull out some whiskey and they sit there and drink, have a drink, waiting for someone senior to come up from the ship so he could hand over the surrender. Bond. He really gets the poops with this. He hands his revolver to one of his his colleagues, and there's one last line of German defenders before the radio station, and the Germans are out there uh, talking to um, one another with in front of their native troops that are in the um, in front of the trench. And before I forget, he also uh, summarily executes um, one of the German um, uh, Germans who had surrendered, but went around he was actually some of the germans they allowed just to return to walk back down the road and go and hand themselves over to the rest of the naval chaps down there he runs around trying to get other native troops together and try and take the fight when bond um knows about this he's a guy who'd been a pow the german he then is given his um word to go back down and, and go and be taken as a pow but goes and decides to continue the fight and bond just shoots him but bond gets up to the last trench hands his revolver over to his colleague to cover him. And whilst the two German officers are out the front, standing in front of the trench while, while their men are behind them, so the men can't shoot and their native troops, they're confused, they're not sure what they can do when their commanders are standing in front of them, he basically just goes up to them and takes their revolvers off them and forces them to surrender and off they pop to take the radio station. So it goes until late into the, very late into the early evening, late afternoon, early evening, it goes for one day as I said, unfortunately, we lost um, um, six um, people, five naval um, chaps and one army guy. The Germans lose um, uh, the one guy, the guy that uh, Bond um, kills. Bond, as I said, uh, for his bravery of taking the revolvers out of the Germans in front of the trench uh, is awarded a DSO, and they successfully take the um, the, the wireless station. And um, within not too long... Um, by the 17th of September, a, a term of capitulation of the Germans had um, had been signed and it was all over. David, it's just extraordinary. I mean, thank you for that account. There's so many twists and turns and, and small acts of heroism and, and incredible individual stories. It's really The word that struck me as you were talking about it is it's really quite quaint, and I don't say that to be patronising to what was going on, but considering the horrors that awaited, awaited these men you know, as they went on through the rest of the First World War, this was really a sort of an old-fashioned way of fighting a very small battle, wasn't it? It was, it was really just an extraordinary state of affairs. It was. I mean, it was. Um, if you were to read um, some extracts in the Australian, I think it's volume ten of the of the First World War history, you've got men talking about, as I said before, that it was a Sunday school picnic. It was a, it's a boys' own adventure. You've got guys sitting down with the enemy, drinking whiskey. I mean, this is, you've got others where they, you know, letting them just um, um, pass back down, like Mortara that had his hand amputated, he just walks back down. And I mean, it's all very gentlemanly. Um, and uh, I don't think either side really uh, had any idea of what was about to to unfold in the years following. It's just, I mean, it's an extraordinary, it's not what we think the First World War is all about. It is an extraordinary story, David, and obviously a small action, especially considering what was to come in Gallipoli the following year and then the, the horrors of the Western Front. But it's not insignificant, is it? What what we did there is was really important for Australia's history, for not just during the First World War, but in the years to come. Tell us a little bit about the significance of the fighting up there, which was much greater than the, the size of the battle. Yeah, um, not to... Well, two things I'd like to say. First one is I, I can't go on without mentioning the loss of our submarine, the AA-1. It's only recently been discovered, the last resting place. 35 hands lost their lives. So um, there was a underlying um, sadness to, to the story, and by no means am I taking away from the six on our side and um, the 30-odd native troops that they believe lost their lives and the, um, and the one German. But, um, yes, in terms of that one action, um, what unfolds, is that we have a, a garrison force that's sent up there, uh, um, which is which ends up becoming tropical force. Uh, in fact, if you go to a bit of Parker Cemetery, you'll see a lot of graves to tropical force who are guys that succumbed to tropical disease whilst they were on garrison duty. Obviously, malaria is a big one. Um, but 
of course, after the First World War, because this sort of gets left behind, yeah, because we've got uh, the horrors of Gallipoli and then the Western Front, and this just becomes a footnote almost in um, in the First World War. But there is a bigger, bigger picture here and something that I, the reason why I think it is the most important battle that we that we fought, and that is because in the First World War, the Japanese were actually our allies. They batted well above their average in terms of, um, of shipping. They escorted um, uh, Australian soldiers to the Dardanelles, which was very, very important. You know, gave them gave them safe passage, if you will, especially when we're sending all these men overseas and we've still got the German um, Navy running around the Pacific. They do very well. In fact, I've got a wonderful photo of naval, Japanese naval officers at that very wharf where the men had first landed with the a and inspecting Australian forces. And of course, after the First World War, when the war spoils are being divided up, Australia's uh, seat, if you will, uh, of the League of Nations, Treaty of Versailles, carving up all the all the spoils of war, including land gains, Australia says, well, you know, look, we, we, want, this, um, we want this area. But there was another ally that also wanted this territory, and that was Japan. As I said, I think Japan lost about 800 sailors. They bat well above their average, and they said, Look, we want it. In fact, they accused um, countries like Australia for being racist, saying, oh, no, you don't think our contribution is great enough. We should have some of it. But our, um, well, I think it was our ex-prime minister at the time had really fought hard and, and said, look, we want this territory. And in the end, it becomes mandated territory to Australia. And part of the uh, League of Nations decision of mandated territory was that you couldn't do things like build um fortifications and you couldn't train native troops however as we're to see in the second world war you know on on i think it's 23 january 42 the japanese invade um rabao they get rid of lark force which was mainly the second 22nd uh, an infantry battalion that had been sent to garrison and, and they use it from then on as their main base they do all their operations for the kokoda campaign all their operations against the Americans on the Solomon Islands, and they use it as their main base in that part of the um, of of the Pacific. So much so that when the Allies eventually push in the Second World War, push on to Japan, they bypass and and rebel doesn't fall until um, properly until surrender of the Japanese. So I guess had we not fought that one day in September, had we not then said, "Hey, look, we've done something here. We should be given this territory," then I think. Um, the war in the Pacific in World War II may have turned out very, very differently. That's a really interesting point, David. I, considering what the Japanese did in only a year or two in Rabaul, the fortress that they turned it into and what an important base it was, I'm just trying to imagine if they had had occupation of it between the wars since since you know the end of the First World War until the Second World War, what a fortress they could have turned that into. You're absolutely right. It was a, a, a crucial uh, decision that affected the the history for decades to come and even up till today because Rabaul would have been an impregnable fortress if the Japanese had had decades to develop it. Undoubtedly, and could always ponder the question, would would have Japan, had Japan been given that territory, would Japan have um, abided by um, the mandate on what you could and couldn't do there? My personal opinion, probably not. And... Maybe um, they may have made mainland Australia. We don't know. It's just fascinating. And as always, when we talk about these great chapters of history, David, I like to bring it back to the present by talking about what you can now see there on the ground. And you and I are actually going to be going there uh, next year. We're going to be going on our World War II cruise. One of the key destinations is Rabaul. And so I'm really looking forward to being there with you and, and walking the ground where this battle unfolded. What can you see there today that's left over from the First World War? Well... One, a couple of things from the First World War that you can see that I think is truly remarkable that it's still there and the fact that uh, I think it's best kept secret of Rabaul. There is a road that takes you up to Bitter Parker Cemetery. It's tarred now, but that's basically the road where the battle unfolded. The wireless station ended up being dismantled and brought down and AWA here in Australia ended up using part of the equipment but on the right hand side of the road is still the very ground where the wireless station is when you get to bit of parker to the cemetery itself you have um the graves of some of those men that i spoke about pockley for example you also got a wonderful um they rebuilt the original memorial 
but the memorial that was built when the Japan and it was there before the Japanese occupied during Japanese occupation of Rabaul, it got all overgrown. I have a wonderful photo of Australian soldiers that come up at the end of the Second World War sitting on this um, uh, sort of stonework, and some of that original stonework now has um, been put into the um, into the memorial itself. But if you were to go back down the road, back to uh, Cabocol itself, although it's been built upon, not by much, the original jetty, if you will, which is basically stones into the into the water, you can walk down on it. You can actually drive a vehicle down onto it and you can stand pretty much in the very, very spot and it's and it's very well maintained in the sense that not a lot of activities, there's a few buildings and what, but you can be there on the very spot where these chaps at 7 a.m. on the 11th of September landed, Australia's first amphibious landing. It's just extraordinary. It's 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 what we love about walking battlefields is is bringing that history to life. And and if anyone listening wants to join us, David and I and a number of other excellent historians will be on this World War Two cruise that we're doing from Brisbane in August next year. So visit our website if you wanted to see details of that, because we'll be telling the story obviously of Rabaul in the Second World War and Milne Bay and other exciting destinations, but also talking specifically about this battle in World War One. Really a forgotten chapter of the First World War. David, it's just been wonderful. Thank you so much for your insights into this and for keeping this memory alive. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. 